Welcome to worship. The scriptures say, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And I truly believe that with all of my heart, that God is good. So let's take some time this morning to just worship him and praise him, because he, just for simply that reason, that he is good. Um, we're going to start off worship with a few songs, so let's stand together and let's lift our voices and sing. We will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. 
take some time to turn and greet one another in the name of the Lord.
gone and your fears coming true how did you end up like this feeling so lost like your life is in pieces too broken to fix and shame's got you tied to a weight you can't lift but the biggest mistake that you made isn't too big I need you. There we are. Can you hear me okay now? Well, welcome everybody to worship. It's good to be together this morning. Glad, glad that you've come. Uh, you know, first service, they had to battle through a little slipperiness. Maybe you had a little bit in on the, on the way in today too, but I'm glad that you've come. It was good to be together. Good to see one another. Welcome to uh, college students who are uh, coming back, visiting, being with mom and dad. Glad that you're here. Glad that you've come and encouraging us by your presence. But also a special welcome to all of you who are newcomers with us this morning. You're wondering, you know, what's this church all about? Who's Jesus Christ? I'm glad that you've come today too. Uh, you're answering our prayers by your presence here. And I pray that you come to know, you know, His power at work in your life. Not only to you know His strength and power, but to redeem people. To take people from where they are now to make Him all that He wants them to be. I'm glad that you're here. If you're a newcomer with us this morning, if you would please take just the time to uh, take the communication card and, and write your name and any contact information on that, we'd be grateful to have it. We'd like to build a relationship with you if you would allow us to do so. But we're glad that you're here this morning. As we begin worship, there's a couple things that are happening that you need to know about. Number one, there are two opportunities for prayer that are coming up this coming week. Number one is uh, Friday night, beginning at 5 o'clock in the Friendship House, the uh, youth are sponsoring and supporting and carrying on a prayer, um, a prayer vigil every hour on the hour beginning at 5 o'clock. And they would like for you to uh, submit prayer requests for them. So there's a box uh, in the, at the welcome table inside the glass doors here. But there's also a box for prayer requests at the coffee table after worship. You can find them there. Uh, you can put your prayer requests there. But we also need people who are going to be uh, just sort of supervising being there uh, every hour, so you commit to one hour. And we need some people who are going to be there you know, all through the night. Mark Tenclay, what time are you coming? 
One o'clock in the morning. All right. Mark's coming at one. I'm probably going to be there two or three or four o'clock in the morning. But we need some people to carry down, uh, hold down each of those hours throughout that 24 hour period just to have somebody there who's just kind of watching over things. So that's Friday night through Saturday. Sunday night, we have an opportunity to join with our sister church, Bethel Reformed, here in town, and uh, Emmanuel CRC and First CRC. And we're gathering at the building at uh, Emmanuel for uh, a prayer time to pray for our community. We're praying over not only the crops and the industries that God would give us, but also uh, praying over our schools, praying over our um, you know, service organizations and service people, uh, pe- particularly uh, nurses and doctors who are in the hospital as well. We need to pray for them. And so that's Sunday night at 6 p.m. Just kind of mark your calendars. It's going to be a large gathering of folks on a very good evening of seeking the Lord together. Uh, one little note for those of you who are in the leadership of the church as elders and deacons. Our meeting is not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday night, and we're going to meet over here in the lounge for our meeting. Uh, we're going to pray in just a little bit, but three prayer notes. Uh, two of them are in the bulletin. Remember to pray for pray- Paige Van Wyk. She is uh, going out this week to Honduras, and she is going to be helping install a water system with her team from Bethel uh, uh, College in Minneapolis, and also to share not only so that people can have water, but the living water that is found in Jesus Christ. So pray for her. Remember to pray for Denise Port. She's also in the uh, uh, bulletin. She's going to be having back surgery on Friday, and this is a, something she's anticipated for a long time and looks forward to. Uh, she's been in significant pain for quite a long time, so please remember to pray for her. But the third item that we didn't get into the bulletin this week is a prayer request for Cornelia Oldenkamp. Uh, Cornelia uh, is, lives at the Christian Retirement Home, would usually come to first service if she does uh, come, but she has pneumonia, and she's going to be there for a little while at the hospital. So please remember to pray for her. She's getting better, but uh, you know, as, as we all get older, it takes a little bit longer to heal from these things. So remember to pray for her as well. So let's uh, turn our hearts to the Lord. Friends, please pray with me. Lord, you are the God who is above all things. The scriptures say that you are the first, the last, the beginning, and the end. You are above all things, you are before all things, Lord, and all things find their life and their being in you. You spoke and brought the world into existence. You sustain us day in and day out by your providence. Lord, you are the one who, has, uh, when the world had fallen into sin and disrepair and corruption. You are the one who enacted your plan in order to save the world through your Son, Jesus Christ. You are the one, Lord, who has opened our eyes and moved in our hearts and caused us to believe. You are the one, Lord, who speaks to people in visions and dreams and reveals yourself to them that they may come to believe. Lord, you are the one who's inspired the, the work of the of and writing of the scripture so that we may know who you are and what you're doing in this world. And certainly your call upon our lives to believe as well. We bless you that you are the God from whom all good and perfect gifts come. And we thank you for the gift of your son in whom you have given us salvation through faith in him. And we bless you today, Lord. We bless you. And as we come before you in prayer at your invitation, we bring before you our sister Paige, and we pray that you will uh, give her and her team safety as they head down to Honduras. Not only give them help, Lord, to finish the task, but Lord, we pray that you would open up the doors of opportunities to share the good news of Jesus Christ, the living water, with the people in the village that they'll be serving. And we pray, Lord, for her, but we also remember Callie Nordhall and Brandon Frick and, and Chad Den Hartog, Lord, as they're coming back from their respective spring break trips as well. And for each of these young students, Lord, as they're discerning the future, you know, they're going to school and learning particular things and particular skills that might help them with employment someday or, or just the living of life. We pray through what they're have gone and experienced and through what Paige would experience in the future, that they may be discerning of your particular call on their life. You know, maybe you will call them into an occupation, Lord. But I pray that you, they, 
you would challenge them to question whether that's what you want them to do or there's something more, something different, something to follow you, Lord, and into ministry and to, to give their life and their energy, Lord, to the building up and the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry that you've given to all of us to do. So give them clarity, Lord. We lift them before your, your throne today. Father, we pray for the y- young people who are leading our uh, uh, prayer vigil this coming weekend. And thank you for their leadership. Thank you for the initiative that they've shown to organize it and put it together. Thank you, Lord, for their heart. And wanting themselves to seek you in prayer, but Lord, call their fellow students together to seek you and call upon your name. And we pray for these young, young people. Lord, the, the world wants them to you know, save up. The world wants them to, to get a job and, and be comfortable in life. The, lo- the world wants them, Lord, to have a, you know, enough wealth to, to keep them protected from you know, dangers and harm that may come in this world. The world wants them to, to, to get a job. But, Lord, you call us to lose our lives for you and for the gospel. And we pray for these young people at the very young age and in showing leadership that they will consider forsaking what the world calls them to do and instead taking up what you call them to do and to lose themselves for you and for the gospel. Even experiencing the ridicule and shame potentially of of people who think they're crazy for following you but gaining everything because... Lord, you promise that if we, save, if we lose our lives, we will save it. And so aid them to do so. And we pray as the young people meet and gather and seek you in prayer that you will meet them there in that quiet spot. Throughout the afternoon, the evening, through the early morning, and the morning again, Lord, we pray that you will meet them there. Sovereign Lord, we pray for Denise Ports, and we ask that you would stretch out your hand upon her and deliver her, Lord, from the pain that she's been experiencing. Thank you for the surgery that's coming up. After the surgery, we pray that she may be on a path towards healing and see your hand at work, Lord, in deliverance from this pain in her life. But thank you for the gift of the surgery that's coming. Lord, we pray for our sister Cornelia Oldenkamp, that you would stretch out your hand upon her and cast forth, Lord, the infection and the ammonia in her body that she may have her uh, renewed strength and renewed health. But at the same time as she is experiencing, Lord, the pneumonia, she's also battling cancer, for which we pray that you would heal her. And we pray for our sister Tina, that you will heal her from the cancer. And our brother Ed DeVries, Lord, that you will heal him from the, the cancer. For our sister Elaine, that you would stretch out, Lord, your hand and heal her from the cancer. For these individuals who are facing it very acutely, Deliver them and rescue them, we pray. And not only from the cancer, Lord, would you also deliver them from the effects of the chemo that is so devastating to one's health. We give them before your hands. And Lord, we bless you on this day for the growth of your kingdom and the expanse of the gospel around the world. And we, we thank you and, and see, Lord, what you're doing uh, you know, all over the world, but yet there's unreached people and places. In, in, in South America, there's unreached tribes who need to know the gospel. Lord, we, we bless you for what you're doing in, in uh, Southeast Asia amongst the Asian peoples. Yet there's so few people who have yet to believe, that, for which we pray that they may grow and that people may come to believe and trust in your name. Lord, we thank you for all the great work that's been done in the, the uh, continent of Asia, or excuse me, Africa, and millions of people have come to believe through the missionary work of, of folks in Europe and in North America over the years. And yet there's so, still so many more who need to know you. But Lord, even in our own nation, even in Europe from whom many uh, missionaries have come, people have turned their backs on you. And we pray that you will send now missionaries from these nations who have received missionaries, that you would send missionaries to share the good news of the gospel, that people may believe and trust in you, Lord. So in our own neighborhood, in our own backyard, in our own community, right here in in Sheldon and O'Brien and Sioux County, Lord, 
we pray that you would use us as missionaries. Use us as missionaries at school amongst our classmates. Use us as missionaries, Lord, in, in, on, the, on the show floor, at the workplace, behind the counter, at the desk. Use us as missionaries, Lord, to show and demonstrate the love of Christ and to speak and share that gospel, Lord. Use us as missionaries, Lord, in our, in our neighborhood. And as the weather is warming up, as we anticipate in this week, and people are out and about, Mingling with one another, use us as missionaries, we pray. That the gospel may grow in our own land, in our own nation, and certainly across the world. And to those ends, Lord, we pray now that you would receive, as, as our you know, act of worship and certainly dependence on you, receive our tithes and our gifts, and use them for your kingdom's work, here and across the world. And for the glory of your name, the name of your Son, we pray in all of this. Amen. So, friends, it's our joy, it's our opportunity, it's our delight to uh, worship the Lord with the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And this, this, this just isn't, uh, you know, p- putting, you know, roof over our head or the lights on. But there's good things that God is doing in and through the, the work of the congregation to bring the gospel to people. And it's our joy to give to that. Now, if you're a regular you know, worshiper with us, we give regularly out of worship. If you're a newcomer with us, feel no obligation to give, um, but simply just sing along with the rest of us as we uh, worship the Lord. Please stand and sing with us as we continue to worship God through our giving of our tithes and offerings. Trust in Jesus' name. 
All right. Well, kids, if you're in four years old or in kindergarten, you can uh, head to Children in Worship. Thank you for singing along with us. The rest of us kids, whether we're uh, eight years old or 80 years old, the rest of us, we're going to open up our scriptures. So kids, did you bring your Bibles this morning? I saw a few of you. Oh, yeah. Okay. You know what that means. If you bring your Bibles, you get a little candy after worship, just meet me at my study door. Uh, friends, would you turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, and we'll put our hearts and attention to verse 22. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 through verse 22. And just a little uh, background information. Last week I shared with you the, uh, about Hebrews, and it's written to a particular people at a particular time. That particular people are, are the Jewish people. And so when you read the book of Hebrews, there's lots of references to the Old Testament because the, the writer who's writing wants people to see and know that what is written about in the Old Testament is fulfilled in Jesus. And we're going to get a little bit more of that as we read through the Scripture this morning. Now, we don't see so much Old Testament references as in quotes, but a, a, a lot of allusions and references to the entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament. Just, just for a, a little bit of, a, of background, when God brought his, the people of Israel out of Egypt, you know, into the promised land, he delivered his law unto the people. With the law came specific requirements for uh, not only the tabernacle, the place where worship was to happen, but also what was to happen within the tabernacle. And that meant that there were certain animal sacrifices that were to be made for certain occasions, and certainly for uh, different types of worship, whether that was uh, a guilt offering that one was bringing to the Lord for sin that they had done, or just a praise offering to the Lord, and how those offerings, those sacrifices were to be made. Uh, if you read through that last half of Exodus and in Le into Leviticus, I remember the first time I was reading and I was thinking to myself, this is in the Bible? And then I thought to myself, why don't we do this anymore? And that's why Hebrews was written. Because Jesus fulfills all the requirements of that Old Testament sacrificial system. And we'll walk through that in just a little bit because I want you to kind of see how Jesus makes that happen. But in the midst of that, here's, what's gonna, here's where we're going to go today. In the midst of that, there's, there's something that Jesus does. There's actually four things, two of them we'll cover today, that Jesus does to, to restore that which was done in the fall or that which was lost in the fall when when this sin, this corrupted state that we all possess because we're born into it, when this came into the world, Jesus restores uh, what was done then by four things. We're going to get to two of them in just a little bit uh, in the fall. In the end, here's what's figuratively, Jesus is able to take the toothpaste and put it back into the tube. Figuratively. Something we can't do that only he can do. And we're going to start here at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. Okay, when, G when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not man-made, that is to say, not a part of creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, those are the Old Testament sacrifices, but he entered the most holy place, 
That's inside the tabernacle. The most holy place, once and for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially clean sanctify them so that they're outwardly clean. Well, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit have offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God? For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance now that he has died as a, as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it because a will is enforced only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed everything commandment, every commandment of the law to the, all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop and sprinkled the scroll on all the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood that both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Brian, please pray us in. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for your word, Lord, and for the, uh, the stories it tells of your, of your goodness and faithfulness towards us, Lord. And Lord, I just uh, pray that you would uh, be with us today as we, we come to you, Lord. We come to you, Lord, with, uh, with unclean hearts and unclean hands, Lord, but you make them clean through your blood. And I, uh, I just pray that you would uh, fill us with your spirit this morning, that, that we would uh, be open to your word and to your leading this morning. And, uh, and uh, Lord, I pray that you'd be with Pastor Paul, too, and uh, fill him with your spirit and help him to be a vessel for you. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Brian. Say, so where we're going to go is that we find out these two things of the four that Jesus has done. But in the end... In, in the end, what he's doing, not only to, to, to undo these things, but he wants to free people who are trapped and, and, and in, you know, in chains. He wants to set people free so that they're not longer given over to their, their fanciful addiction, but set free to live, to live a full life once again with him. So, we've read the scripture. If, if, you've, if you've tried to work your way through Exodus and Leviticus, and you've, you've kind of stumbled and and it's been a little bit difficult because you've got all these sacrifices and this given there, and the high priest does this and goes into the most holy place, and you get a little bit confused. Has anybody been there, done that? You're amongst the company of many other people. But what the, the writer of Hebrews wants us to know is that Jesus has fulfilled all these things, all those sacrifices, the sprinkling of blood here and that and there. Jesus fulfills it all. So as I was sitting in the lounge at Slater Hall in Iowa City when I was a sophomore in high school, or excuse me, sophomore in college, and, and, and reading this and wondering, why don't we do this anymore? The answer is, Jesus has, has fulfilled it all. So let me walk through this so that we have a very clear understanding of what the Word is trying to communicate and that out of that what rises these two things. Number one, in, in, there's a tabernacle in heaven. A tabernacle is just a place, a dwelling where God is. Okay, and there was then created an earthly tabernacle. This is what God com commanded Moses and the Israelites to do as part of the worship system that he instituted. But there's parallels to these, but there's, but there's also contrast. First is the heavenly tabernacle, as the scriptures say, is greater and, and more perfect. But the earthly one is just a man-made tabernacle. The heavenly tabernacle is where Jesus is the high priest, where he's the one in control who actually oversees the offering of himself. And in the earthly tabernacle, it's Aaron's descendants. Aaron was the brother of Moses. And he became the high priest, and his descendants after him became the ones who oversaw all of these things. In the heavenly tabernacle, the sacrifice is Jesus. Not only is he the high priest, he's also the sacrifice. But in the earthly tabernacle, the sacrifices are animals, bulls, goats, uh, heifers. And if you were poor enough, they would often use uh, birds as well. In the heavenly tabernacle, Jesus' blood is what's being shed that covers over sin. 
And in the earthly tabernacle, it's the animal blood that's being shed that, that covers sin only minimally uh, and, and outwardly. Uh, the next, uh, in the heavenly tabernacle, people are forever set free from sin because of what Jesus does and the shedding of his blood. But in the earthly tabernacle, there's just this continual need for sacrifice. It only takes care of them outwardly, but does nothing to change and renew the heart. We can go on just a little bit, uh, a few more. The heavenly tabernacle, people are cleansed. Their consciences are cleansed. This is beginning to look inwardly. They, there, there's no more guilt any longer. But in the earthly tabernacle, it's just outwardly clean. In the heavenly tabernacle, there's eternal redemption. It's, it's eternal forever. But in the earthly tabernacle, there's still, still a bondage. And people still need to be set free within from the sin that they've inherited. Heavenly tabernacle is the real deal. It's the real thing. But in the earthly tabernacle, it's a copy. In the heavenly tabernacle, this is the beginning of the new covenant that Jesus establishes by his, the shedding of his own blood. And the earthly tabernacle established was part of the, the old covenant. And all the things in the old covenant were just a foreshadow, a picture of things that were to come that Jesus would himself then fulfill. But out of this, what we see Jesus doing, what percolates from the Scriptures, and out of his offering of himself as the high priest, as a sacrifice for the, the, for the people, for their sin, four things arise. Two of them we'll look at today. Redemption and forgiveness. Redemption and forgiveness. Now, I was uh, sharing about redemption to the people in Washington State when I served there you know, as a pastor in the church. And I told them about this thing we have in Iowa where you can actually bring your cans to the Redemption Center and get a nickel for it. And they just looked at me and they thought, what? Are you crazy? I said, yeah, you can go and you redeem your nickel. You take your, when, you, when you buy your can of pop, you pay your deposit, and when you bring your can back, you actually redeem your nickel. I love this as a little kid. When we drive down the road, my dad would say, oh, there's five cents. I thought, how does he find a nickel on the side of the road like that? I didn't realize he was talking about cans. I picked up every can I could. I bought, my, I bought stuff with those cans. You know how many cans it takes to get to $20? How many is it? 400. That's a lot of cans. But that's what we're doing. Uh, that's the picture I have in mind. You're redeeming your nickel when you bring your can back. Did you know in Michigan it's 10 cents? Oh, yeah, you can make money pretty fast in Michigan. But we're redeeming the nickel back, and that's what Jesus is doing. So this is the first truth point that we need to know about. That is, God redeems and forgives people through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He's paying a price that we cannot pay for ourselves. He's redeeming us to restore us back into right relationship with himself once again. Look carefully at verse 12 with me. The scriptures say, He did not enter by the means of the blood of goats and calves, so the animals don't matter anymore. He entered by the most holy place, once and for all, by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. So when Jesus buys people back, he doesn't buy them just for the day and say, okay, that's good enough. Here you can go back into your old life and your old self. He buys people eternally, forever and for good. And they belong to him forever and for good. Verse 15, check out this. It says, for this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. This new covenant that's established in heaven by his blood. That those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Again, it's eternal. Now that he has died as a ransom to set free from the sins committed under the first covenant. So Jesus pays a, a ransom. What is a ransom? It's just some money given to somebody else to redeem something back. So let's just say, for instance, I, I'm really hoping, I'm really, really hoping that the city council will allow us to have chickens in our backyard. My girls are so excited to have chickens. Let's just say, for instance, somebody comes along and, and breaks into the chicken coop and steals my chickens. And they say, for a price, you can have your chickens back. And so I pay a ransom price to redeem and get my chickens back. You see, that's what Jesus has done. He's paid the price that we couldn't pay to redeem people, to take them out of the condition in which they find themselves 
and make them his own. What is that condition? Now, we're all born into this world in the condition of sin. That's the word we will use to describe the condition of brokenness, describe the condition of you know, things that are opposite of God and who he is and what he's doing in the world. We're born into the world. We have it. We receive it. There's nothing we can do about it. We get it from our parents who got it from their parents, and so on and so forth. But Jesus takes us and buys us back out of that so that we're not given over to that. In that condition, we're given over to all sorts of proclivities to sin and do things that are not pleasing in God's sight, not life-giving to other people. We steal, we're angry, we're, we're greedy, we cheat, we lie. All these things come out of this condition. And Jesus restores and redeems us back out of that. Let me tell you two stories. Number one is a story that comes out of uh, Prison Fellowship, a very popular national uh, prison ministry. This is a story of a, a, a guy named Steve uh, Leggett is his name. And Steve, when he was growing up, he wasn't a real popular guy, but he also wasn't one to have a whole lot of friends, but really longed for friends. He was pretty lonely. As he got older, he found the way to find friends. Through the course of time, he tried a little bit of alcohol, but over the course of time, he became addicted to it. And he was a hi-ho, great, fun-loving guy when he had a bottle in his hand. But that led to more. Eventually, it led to the point where, in, in the midst of his intoxication, he assaulted a man, and that sent him to prison for five years. And in the deepest, darkest place that he'd ever been, he cried out to God, and God came and redeemed him, restored him. And while still in prison, God built him up so he's not his old self anymore, but he's a new self, a new person, because God's bought him back. He's redeemed him from that old life, that old self. And today, on every Wednesday night, he still goes back to that same prison to see some of the same guys who were there and some of the new guys who have come. To teach them and share with them that Jesus can redeem you and restore your life back to new. And not just a life to live unto yourself, to do what you used to do, but to live a new life, not given over to the old selves and the old things. That's the first story. The second story is my friend Rick. Rick was a a uh, friend of mine, we were classmates in seminary together. He, was, he was, had one of the coolest jobs in the world. He was, he was a bounty hunter, but he was, he was a, uh, a, a kind of a sheriff bounty hunter. And he was the guy who busted into the house, guns blazing, well, not necessarily blazing, but he busted into the house to find criminals. He'd crawl into the smallest places to find guys who were hiding out in the house. What a cool job, huh? Well, that's what guys think. Wives think a little bit differently than that. He had a cool job, but you know what? Rick was a good man, and he did good, a lot of good things for the community, but he had one secret problem. He, too, was addicted to alcohol. And God began to work in his life. He got established within a local congregation, and he felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit within his heart. That he said, this has got to change. One Sunday morning, he stood before that newly, there was a newly formed church that he had been a part of, and he said, I... I'm addicted to alcohol, and I cannot get free. And therein, the church laid hands on him and prayed over him. And from that moment on, the Lord freed him. The Lord redeemed him out of that life of just serving the bottle and drinking to his heart's content. To this day, he doesn't drink at all. Because God sets people free. God delivers people through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And friends, he will do the same for us. But not to live a life to our own self, but to live a life to him. You see, what happened to Rick, once he was free from the bottle, you know, he eventually left his job in law enforcement. He gave it up. And today he's a pastor in, in, in the Lord's church. You see, when God sets people free, it's not to live for our own selves and do our own thing, but to live unto him. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the, uh, that what Jesus does as part of you know, uh, restoring what was done in the fall is he forgives people. He forgives people. Think about this for just a second. When, when we're born into this world, we're born into all this, this corruption, and, and it gives us over to do things that we ought just, just ought not to do. And we create this large, large debt that we can't get out from underneath. I remember the story of my friend Mike. He came to us to the church one day, and he said, look, I've got a huge debt that I can't get out from underneath. Can you help me? 
And through the course of time, his own hard work, but the blessing of the church, he came out from underneath that debt. And what a relief it was to be to, you know, essentially free from that debt anymore. How much is, how much is our national debt? Does, it, does anybody know the actual number today? You may keep track of that. I know it's over $17 trillion. How many skyscrapers is that tall? Several. Will it ever get paid back? I don't think there's enough tax money to be able to do so. Frankly, I think we're addicted to debt because it pays for all our stuff. That's a different sermon for another day. Nonetheless, we'll never be able to get out from underneath it, but there's another debt that we owe to God that we can never get out from underneath. And that with each, each thing that we may do against Him, it keeps piling up and piling up and piling it up. But what God does through the shed blood of Jesus Christ is He forgives this gives that debt. Whatever we had accumulated, it's gone. It's wiped clean. It's, and, and it's forgotten about. We may not forget about what people do to us, but we need to know that God forgets about the things that we've done against Him. It's gone. It's like whew, the wind blows it away. It's out of here. How does it happen? God makes it happen by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Not so that we can have our best life now, but so that we can be given over to Him and to His work. God redeems and God forgives people through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And we need to talk about that blood a second. You know, we're, we're, we get a little queasy when we talk about blood. But if you take the blood out of somebody, can they live? The obvious answer is no. You can't. The scriptures say the, the life is in the blood. The blood signifies that shedding of blood, the, the giving of blood, the pouring out of blood signifies that death. Such that the life is in the blood that Jesus' own life then covers or makes atonement for all of our sins. That atonement is just, if you break it up into its syllables, at one meant. He makes atonement to bring us at one with God once again. So that which was lost in the fall is now restored through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. It's not just merely by his death, but only as his death is, is represented by the shedding of his blood on the cross. Jesus' blood covers it all. Now here's the last truth note that we need to know. Jesus' work on the cross is complete. It is once and it is done for all time. It's not going to happen again. It was once and for all. As verse 12 said, he did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the, he entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood. One time for everything. So does that mean everything I've done in the past, he takes away? Yes? Yes, okay. Does that mean everything that I may even be doing now, he takes away? But does that really mean that everything I've done or would do in the future, he takes away? Yes. It's once and for all. It's gone. It's gone. When God opens the eyes and moves within the heart and forgives the person of their sin, it's once, it's done, it's gone for good and forever. In fact, God forgets about it. It's not on his mind. Sometimes we think of God as just waiting to strike us with his lightning bolts. But those who are found in him, in Christ Jesus, we're not looking for lightning bolts. Yes, God will discipline us. But he's not waiting to strike us down and strike us dead. But we have everything to look forward in his grace. Jesus' work on the cross is complete. It is once and it is done for all time. This is good news. This is good news because Jesus, Jesus dies for people. His blood is shed for people who today are caught in that addiction to alcohol. You know, it's one of those things in our smaller communities we don't really like to let people know about, but secretly, we're caught in it. And we don't know how to get out. But Jesus Christ will free people from it. 
You know, and, and, and people who are addicted to their pornography, believe me, friends, it's prevalent. It's everywhere. If it's not pornography, it's those romance novels, and you know the ones I'm talking about, right? We're addicted to them. God has come to set people free from that. God has come to redeem us from our self-righteousness and our pride that we may not be given over to those things anymore. God has come, Christ has come to shed his own blood so that you, you don't have to worry about what people think about you anymore or be addicted to what people think about you anymore. So you don't have to think and be the cool kid anymore. Because what people think doesn't matter. What matters is what Jesus thinks about you. He came to redeem you from that life so you don't have to be a slave to those thinking, those things anymore. He came to free you from, the, from your untamed tongue that's, that's been uh, getting in your way all your life. Jesus has come to redeem people. If you're the bully... God has come to redeem you so you don't have to be the mean guy anymore and lord it over people. He's come to set you free. You don't have to be free, or you don't have to be given over to your addiction to, to sport. You don't have to be given over to your addiction to electronics. And I'm going to tell you, one of the biggest and newest addictions anymore is our, our electronics. Our phones, our computers, our TVs. We're distracted by them. In fact, it's even controlling our thinking. We can hardly, you know, stay with somebody for 30 minutes anymore. Because we're given over to them. We're caught. But Jesus Christ has come to set people free. And when the Son sets people free, you are free indeed. This is the good news of the gospel. That we may not be given over to our, the corruption of the of ourselves anymore, but begin over to God. Okay, we need to put this word into practice with a few simple steps in our own lives. Number one, if you have been forgiven, it behooves you, my friend, to forgive the one who has harmed you most. I don't know what they have done. You may have been stabbed in the back by your own family, but it's time to forgive. You may have had money stolen out of your hand and several thousand dollars perhaps tens of thousand dollars. Someone ripped you off. It's time to forgive. You may have been the one you, ent you, you entrusted secrets to somebody and they blabbed it to the rest of the community. It's time to forgive. You thought you were buying one thing and a guy sold you another thing. Time to forgive. A dairy farmer I knew once said, I bought a cow that was healthy and I got it home and it was full of antibiotics because it was very, very sick. It ripped me off. It's time to forgive. If you have received forgiveness from the Lord, it behooves us to forgive the one who's harmed you most. Here's the second thing. I really want you to do this. Go down to the redemption center Redeem your, your nickels. And when you do, think this thought. That Jesus redeemed you from bondage as well. He bought you back with a price. He didn't buy you with silver or gold or the things of this world. He bought you at a price with his own precious blood. Re go down to the redemption center. Redeem your nickels. Get them back. And remember that Jesus redeemed you from bondage as well. And this last one. Keep following him during this season of Lent and bring your confession to the Lord. We're going to do that in just a moment in our, in our closing prayer here. And when we come to confession, I'm not asking you to stand up and tell everybody about, you know, everything that you've done. But we'll have a pr time of prayer and a silent confession to the Lord. But why do we do this? If Jesus has taken... If Jesus has taken away all of our sin, we're forgiven, he redeems us, why do we do this? Number one, so that we can know God's grace in our lives once again, all the more. So that gratefulness and thanksgiving may, and, and worship and glory to God may be rise up. But here's the thing. We, we have a position before God that can't be taken away. If we have believed and trusted and we're following, and we, if we believe, we have a place that can't be taken away. But in the living of life in this world, we can, if we're just continuing on in a, 
you know, doing what is, you know, God doesn't like, what's sin, what's evil. We're walking over here in the dark. And we're butting heads against the Lord. And it's not good. We need to confess. And when we confess, we kind of move over here into the light. Where there's sweet fellowship and close relationship with God once again. Where we hear from Him, our prayers are heard, and we can walk with Him day in and day out. When we confess, He promises to forgive so that we kind of we move from you know, darkness into light, so to speak, and walk in a sweet fellowship of relationship with Him. So as we pray, we're gonna, as we close now, we're going to move into confession. You just follow me where we go. And um, when you confess, just you don't have to remember everything. Because even if we can't remember it, Jesus died for it on the cross. But take an assessment of your life. Where am I? How am I? Am I living the way the Lord wants me to live, or am I living unto myself? Let's pray. And Lord, we confess that we need you. We need to know, Lord, your redemption for us and your forgiveness for us. And we pray that this truth would just speak volumes into our hearts and into our lives. We pray that you would free us, Lord, from the addictions that we have. That you would free us, God, from the, the, that corruption that we're born into that gives us over to being self-serving people that maybe give us over to our anger, our rage, our malice, our slander. Lord, to our very greed. Lord, we're addicted to, to our electronics, to things that take us away from you. We're addicted to sport. Lord, forgive us. And we'd ask now that you would come and search our hearts, that as we silently confess these things to you, Lord, that you would lift the burden off of our shoulders and set us free. Lord, we need you. Hear our prayer. Hear our confession. In your name we pray. If you know this song, would you please sing along with me? If, if this tune is unfamiliar with you, just pleasantly enjoy the, the singing of those around you. But if you know this song, would you please sing with me? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, that you, by your blood shed on the cross, have redeemed us and forgiven us. We love you. Amen. Friends, the good news of the gospel is this. Therefore, there is, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. This is the good news of the gospel. My friends, now go forth and live in peace. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand to sing. So as we get ready to sing here, uh, as we heard in the message, you know, the Christ's death on the cross was there to redeem us. He has redeemed us by that. And that is the power of the cross. So please join us in singing. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sin.
my friends, go with the Lord's blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and tomorrow and forevermore. Amen.